chapter 15. Now you're kind of like, well, Pastor, could you milk this passage out anymore? Uh, turn around and, and look at this from really three perspectives. And I'm just amazed. Uh, keep in prayer. We talk about the church website a little bit. And we've been putting the sermons on there. So I've been watching that. In the Father's Day service, um, we've had just about 53 people have downloaded and listened to that Father's Day service. Um, just this past, what, two weeks. And so, continue to pray for that. Uh, it's funny to see kind of what's going on there. Uh, this month, we've had like 1,600 people visit the web- website. We've had close to 500 sermons listened to. And so, all those things are all back on there in audio. we got some uh, video as well. And so, it's amazing what the Lord is doing. Uh, reaching, I pulled up through, and we got folks, in, someone from Pakistan, went to the church website and pulled off a message. I don't know if they understood a word that I said, but, uh, but so it's amazing what the Lord can do all from here in Stockton Springs. But this gone through and we looked at the, the prodigal father and we looked at the relationship he had with his son and last week we looked at the son who went and wandered away and how the Lord draws him back. And so just real quick, I want to just kind of go through the story and, and remind ourselves how we got here. And then we're going to look at the tail end. Because last week we talked about the prodigal son, how he came home. Right? And how exciting it is to see in the father, you know, kill the fatted calf. My son who was dead, who came home. And the joy and the celebration and, and really the, probably the shock and humility of the son who's like, Dad, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And, and you brought me home. And not only just be one of your servants, I'd be happy with that, but you've thrown the robe on me, you've given me the ring, you put shoes on my feet, you've welcomed me back. And, and how the Lord brings us back that way. When the Lord loves us and He wraps His arms around us and He goes, all our sins are forgiven when we confess them. And we're like, oh Lord, I, you know, all those stupid things I did. And He goes, I don't remember them anymore. They're all gone. And what a, what a, I, I, can I tell you something that just kind of blows me away? That it doesn't matter our past, it doesn't matter what we've done, that we are declared whole and we are declared forgiven and redeemed all through Jesus Christ. And that is, uh, I don't deserve that. You don't deserve that. But he still does it. But go ahead, we're going to start picking up verse 11, chapter 15 of Luke. And like I said, we're going to go through the story, and we've talked about most of this already, but it's going to get a running start for some of you who haven't uh, been following along up to this point. It says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And now many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to his said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to make merry. Like I said, this is where we've gone in the story so far, and so far this is the happy ending. We all love a happy ending, don't we? You know, they all live happily ever after. Isn't that we kind of wish for in our lives. You know? I was old enough that I grew up on Disney films. 
And I remember my mom, you know, watching some of the, you know, Sleeping Beauty and all these other ones, and and things look awful and things look scary. And my mom would reassure me, it's, it's okay, because they all live happily ever after. Some of you have been around the block a few times. And in this lifetime, how often do we get our happily ever after? You know, this past few weeks, I've had the chance to, to be in the hospital and visit some of you and talk to Roberta. And we get a chance to send her a card of encouragement. We'll get her address. And, and uh, I tell you, it makes a world of difference to have the body. And she's so appreciative for the love of you all. And I asked her how she's doing, and she goes, physically she's not hurting, she's not in a lot of pain, she's just really tired, and really kind of down. And she goes, you know, this getting old thing, it's not all cracked up to be, right? And just like in real life, the, the story doesn't end here with the happily ever after, because now we break into the, remember the got another brother. There's always, there's always someone else. And the beginning of the story, remember the younger son says, hey dad, I want my inheritance. And what an insult that was. And the fathers took it and actually divided up what he had. He divided it up between the two brothers, right? So both brothers got their portion. Actually being the older brother, he got what was called a double portion. So he knew there's two kids, so he would have got two thirds of the inheritance. And the younger son would have got the lesser. And obviously the, younger, the older brother stayed. The younger brother took off and wasted it all. Well, the story picks up because now the son has come home. The dad is rejoicing. They throw a party. Everything's going great. Until the older brother shows up. He says, now his older son was in a field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your brother has killed, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Don't you love families? My family is all 1,200 miles away. I get along great with them. I have no conflict over all the years with my family. You know, we go see them, we visit for about two weeks, and then we come home, and I don't get caught up in all the drama. But I miss it. You know, I miss my family, not the drama. Because, of course, my family doesn't have any drama. Because I'm 1,200 miles away, right? But the brother comes up, and he's been out working hard as he's been doing for, now, we don't know how long the brother's been gone. Presume it's a while. He comes home to a scene he's not familiar with. There's a, there's a party going on, and he's like, well, well what's going on? And he calls the servant instead of checking it out himself. He says, oh, your brother's come home. My brother. <sighs> Sermon's like, hey, are you going to come in? I ain't going in there. And he stays outside. And it's interesting because if we go down through the account, we go through down the story, um, this is really gets broken up in a really three easy ways. So the first one, we see a contrast. We see a contrast between... The father, the older son, and the younger son. Of how they react to the situation that's going on here. And can I tell you, as one who has served the Lord most of my life, as one who's been in ministry, and I let you know, last week I shared, you know, I've always haven't been perfect. I rebelled. I went through a period of rebellion. But comparatively, it was a pretty short period of time. Some of it was building up, like I said, my teenage years. I didn't act out all I should. 
Then after college, my one year, I was really kind of run wild. But after that, the Lord got a hold of me. And, and by the time I was, what, 20, about 22, I was in Bible school. I was preparing for the ministry. So I, I don't have a long trail of rebellion, but just enough. And as one who has served and always been one who does and, and always been involved, I, I can understand because I think some of us kind of can relate to the older brother. Because sometimes it seems like maybe those who have wandered off, maybe those who have, have gone off and done their own thing, messed up along the way, and all of a sudden they come back and wait a minute, they, they get all the attention. You know, over the years I've noticed sometimes those who have these tremendous testimonies of being involved in drugs and alcohol and, and women and all these things, and then they get right with the Lord and then they come up, now they have this fantastic testimony. And in here they share this testimony and people are like, wow, right? How amazing it is that God sir, you know, saved you and called you back and forgave you. And it's like, oh, wow. And, and those who have been faithful over the years almost feel like... Wait a minute. How about me? So my heart kind of goes out to the older brother. And preparing this sermon, it was real challenging because I saw some of me in this. Maybe some of you see that as well. The big contrast that we see is this idea of expectations. Sorry. Right? The older son, he wasn't expecting anything. He was off doing what he did every day, right? I don't know how much thought he even gave to his brother. Now we have the father who had the expectation he knew. He knew in his gut his son was going to come home. Right? He was watching. He was doing every, what he was doing every day, but he would look up and think and maybe pray for his son. And so as soon as he came over the hill, he said, Oh, that's my son. He went running, right? That is the response he had. Where's the, where's the older brother? He's off in the field. Actually, when he shows up, he was sort of surprised. Oh, my brother's home? <sighs> right? Now the younger son, he came home. He was expecting to come back as a servant. He was expecting to be nothing, right? And he was surprised by the reaction he got from the father. But the contrast, the father was looking and waiting. And the older brother didn't have that expectation at all. And can I tell you something? And I'm really speaking to sort of us church people, you know? Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a long time and, and we look at those that, you know, they say they're a Christian or they used to come to church and now they're not. And, and Is it so easy to fall into that? You know what? They're never going to change. Right? You know, people come, people go and I've been plugging along and I don't even think about them anymore. You know, how many people in the church here have come and gone over the years? And maybe we pray for them for a little bit. But after a while, we maybe even stop doing that. Right? The expectations. We need more like the Father. The Father was expecting. We should be praying for these ones. We should be expecting, Lord, you're going to get a hold of them. And they'll get a hold of you. Second one is the situation. Right? The younger son comes home and all of a sudden now he's got the ring and he's got the robe and the, he's got the party going on and they're all celebrating, right? But you look at that situation. He's home. And his father loves him and he's accepted him. The father, he looks at the situation and he shares. He goes, My son who was dead is now alive. He's home. Now the brother, the older brother, He's totally disconnected from what's going on. Right? He's so caught up in himself. He's so wrapped up in his own thoughts that he doesn't realize, wait, my brother is getting right. My brother's being restored. Right? 
that all that insecurity, all those wrestling, all those things he was doing out in the world, that's all gone. He's back. But the son, the older brother, doesn't see any of that. And it's so easy to get caught up and not see what God is doing in someone's life. To avoid looking at the situation of really what's behind the scenes. We get this one little snapshot. All, all the older brother can see is, wait a minute, he's back? And he gets a party? That's not right. And the brother has totally lost all perspective of the whole situation. Of what all the things that led up to that point. Up to this point as well, we see a contrast in the attitude. Right? Now, picture the scene. The older son, the, the younger brother, how do you think he feels coming home and being loved on? I think there's a relief. There's joy. The father, we know. Right? He's just overcome. Right? The, the, the fatty calf was, was saved for a special occasion. Right? Now he's home. The, what, the father can't think of anything more special than this. What's the attitude of the older brother? Oh, he's back. How long is this going to last? Right? But what's he want now? Actually, we see actually his attitude gets such that he only came home because he's broke. He's going to go home for more money. That's all he wants. Sponge off dad some more. What's that going to do for him now? An attitude on forgiveness. Now it's interesting because what did the son, what did the, the younger brother do against the older brother? He, he left, but didn't take anything. Him, the father divided up the portion. The older brother got his portion. He got what he was going to get, right? The, the sin wasn't against brother against brother. The sin was son, the father. It's interesting how the attitude of unforgiveness sinks in when he's not even the one who the sin was against. You know, I'm I'm often amazed how people get offended for other people. Right? I get all worked up. When the offense isn't even against them. We see this in churches. You know, as pastor, I've had people come up mad at me because of something else, and I'm okay with it. I've gone to them and said, "Hey, we're all we're all okay." But someone else is bent out of shape because of right. But this attitude of unforgiveness, of bitterness, because however long the son, the older, was working in the field and the younger was gone, you can see this bitterness just built up. Right? Oh, he's. You know, here I am working away from my dad, and oh, he's all having a grand time. He's spending all that money, and he's doing all this and all of that. And he should be here. He should be one doing this. And we see that bitterness that just eats away. We see this within churches. We see this within families. We see this instead of rejoicing over their pens, we see this bitterness that sits in. The passage goes on and says, Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Although these many years I have been serving you, I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now it's interesting because we talk about the idea of the son. You know what? Both of these sons had problems. Do you see that? Now one acted out on him. One picked up and left. But the son who stayed, he was 
He was eaten up with bitterness. He was pulled away from his father. Now, I mean, not physically, but we see that emotional rip, right? He comes up through. And what does the dad do for both, both sons? The younger comes over the hill. His dad sees him and runs to him. Here we have the older son outside. Oh, I can't believe it. And what's, he, what's the son do? What's the father do? He goes out to him. Can I tell you something? These two sons have a lot more in common than they think they do. But see, the problem is, whereas the younger son realized his issue and came back, the older one does not see his problem. Actually, if anything, you know what? He builds up his case, but the problem comes in this is that the older brother has a big eye problem. Did you pick up this passage? All these years I have done this. That you never killed the one for me. That for my friends and I and I and I and his problem was me, Dad. What about me? See, he was just as selfish as the other brother. But it was all inside. That resentment. That he missed the situation. He missed all what was going on because he was so stuck on himself. And so many Christians, folks, we get caught up in that bitterness and we get caught up in that attitude that it's all about me. Also, I want to point out something. Remember when the, when the younger brother came home? He was afraid that his dad or dad, dadder, that his dad wouldn't forgive him. He was afraid that his father would be bitter against him. He was afraid of all these things. But none of those things the father did. But these are all attitudes that his brother had. Can I tell you something? Over the years, I've talked to so many people who wanted to start coming back to the Lord, who wanted to start coming back to church. But you know what their one, number one fear is? What are other people going to think? People who know what I've done. I haven't been there for a while, so it becomes just easier not to go. Right? Because the longer you don't, the easier it becomes, doesn't it? I was in high school, and I took a Spanish class. Don't ask me to speak Spanish. I don't know any taco, enchilada... I can speak I can speak Chinese uh, Mexican, Mexican Chinese I can, I can speak Mexican food but not anything else than that and I was in high school and I started to skip class I was in the school I went to was a class double A it was a really large school on a huge campus and if you miss class most of the time I don't think the teacher even knew you weren't even in the class they were so big and so I started skipping class I skipped one week and two weeks and three weeks well, then I got to a point where I missed so many weeks that I was like, now it's embarrassing to show up. Right? So I didn't go again. And then a month went by, and I hadn't been in class. And I'm like, oh, I can't go back, I can't go back. I missed class for about four months. I didn't go to Spanish class. Because how do, you, how do I go back? Right? And the longer I was gone, the easier it was. Well, I knew in the back of my mind report cards were going to come up. And I've always been an A-B student, and I didn't want to get a bad grade. And so I'm like, oh, what do I do? So I showed up in Spanish class one day. I hope my mom doesn't listen to this, because I don't know if she knows this. And I showed up in class. Now, I've been gone most of the year. And I came up and I told the teacher, I sat down in the class like nothing was going on. The teacher looked at me and goes, what are you doing here? And I said, well, my family was gone for a while, we're, we're back. And I said, are you as far as you said you were? And before I left, we talked about, and I hold, totally lied. I said, you know, we, I left, I said, we, you know, I asked you where you would be. And, and I said, have you guys gotten as far as you thought you would? And the teacher kind of was... Bo- Befuddled, and she said, oh, "No, we're really far behind." And so I picked up class right where we left off. I ended up getting a C in Spanish. But I always 
think it's, I got, you know, it's interesting. I got to that point where it was, it was embarrassing to go back. It was, how do I explain coming back? And I think a lot of people feel that way about church. If I've been gone, how do I come back? What are people going to think? And maybe, maybe sin's been involved. Maybe I've been doing things I'm not supposed to do. All right? And if I come back, what are people going to say and think? We've already looked at the story. You know what? When people come back to God, you know what He does? He wraps their arms around them and forgives them. If they repent of their sin, He forgets it. People need to realize that forgiveness that the Father gives them and beckons them to come back with open arms. But you know what this story tells us? The problem is, it's us. Because we treat sometimes these people like they're afraid to be treated. They're afraid to come back. And what happens is they think God is reflective of how we treat them. Oh, can you believe they came back? Oh, you know what they were doing? Oh. Man, we're probably more like the older brother than you like to admit. Second thing is, he's self-righteous. Right? Oh, Father, this son of yours, he went out, look at all the horrible things he got. I've been with you all these years and I've never done anything wrong. Right? I haven't trespassed against you at all. Now, there's a Greek term for that, hogwash. It's a big theological term. Right? Do you think the, I, I, I can tell you, this, the, the brother here, he's got an attitude problem. Is this the first time it showed up? I don't think so. Has he done everything perfectly along the way? I don't think so. And what happens is, is people come back to the Lord. People come back. It's the older brothers. It's, it's us Christians who get all haughty and say, look how much better I am than they are. And I'm not immune to that. there would be times when my wife and I will be talking about someone and I'll be like, oh, I can't believe they did that. And I'll get all, all haughty and everything else. And, and my wife, she's pretty good at keeping me grounded. Cause she'll look at me and she'll say, wait a minute, didn't you do the same thing that they're doing when you were that age? That's different. Right? And if I'm honest, there are things in my life that I have done that maybe I got away with and no one knew about it. Sometimes God's grace allows me to avoid the consequence of that sin. And someone else who does the exact same sin gets caught. Then who am I to get all haughty? But we do. Oh, by the grace of God, there goes I. And it's so easy to get that haughty attitude. Right? Well, I'm not like that. I would never do that. What's wrong with them? You know what? That self-righteousness just drives people away. Right? Church isn't full of perfect people. We are a church full of sinners who enjoy the grace of an almighty God. And that becomes attractive. When I'm not the judge and jury of someone, their sin, once again, the, the sin wasn't against the brother, the sin was against the father. And oftentimes what happens in these people in their lives, what they've done isn't, a, isn't against me, it's against God. It's for them to get right with God. And when that relationship is restored, I need to sit back and rejoice over that. Because guess what? It has nothing to do with me. Right? The last thing is, in this case, he builds up here. It's a total lack of love. It's a total lack of love. I love this because you read this account, he goes down through and he says, and this son of yours. Did you pick that up? Well, guess what? 
What he left out was, this is my, my brother. This is my brother. Now growing up, my sister was five years older than me, and, and she was kind of a brute to us kids. All us younger brothers, she would beat us up, she'd threaten us, and scare us. And one day I was out in school, and I was probably about fifth grade, and I was getting picked on by the high schoolers. This is up in southern Rustic, Maine. I don't know if you guys know where that is. Up in Dyer Brook. And I was being picked on by the high schoolers. The, the, the school system was so small, the kids were all in one school. And I was being picked on by this really big guy. It had nothing to do with how was a mouthy kid. It had nothing to do with that at all. And we're at the bus stop. And one day, this came, came over, he pushed me down, and he's like, I'm going to pound your face in. And my sister came over. Now, for me, you know, five years is a big difference, so she was a lot bigger than me, but she was really smaller than this guy, and she came up, and she pushed him. And she goes, he's my brother, you leave him alone, you mess with him, you mess with me. And that scary voice of hers, I, I had heard many times. I was like, ah. and, uh, but she, it wasn't directed at me, it was directed at this guy. And this guy was like, Ur, and she's like, Hold her. and he's just like, okay, whoa, 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 okay. She turned around and she helped me up. And I was like, wow. You know why? Because no matter what happened in the house, no matter how much I irritated her, no matter all these things, I was her brother. Right? And that love comes in. That, right? I mean, I mean, most of you have siblings, right? And they drive us nuts. When we're newly married, my, my sister-in-law... Came to, came to school and lived upstairs from us. And I remember one day, you know, my wife was kind of going off, mumbling about her sister. Because that's what sisters do. And she was going off and she was like, oh, rah, 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 she's driving me nuts, rah, 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 and all that. Well, I learned a lesson that day because I did something very foolish as, a, as an in-law. I said, yeah, she is annoying. And yes, yeah, she is that. And I was agreeing with her. And I was going on and... Most of you have been down this road. Do you know what happened? She turned on me, my wife. The love of my life, the bride of my youth turned on me. Right? And I'm like, wait a minute. I was just agreeing. I just was saying what you were saying. I was just agreeing with you. But she goes, she's my sister. I can say it, but not you. Why? Because of the love that's there. See, what was disconnected here? And this is, happens in churches. I see this as, as we minister to people. I can tell you how many people over the years have turned around and said, you know what, I believe in God, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to go to church because I've been burned, I've been hurt, I don't want to, I'm against organized religion. I would dare say even probably the church here. There are people we have hurt, there are people we have pushed away. Not because of the love of the Father is lacking, but the lack of love between us. That we forget these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when they work things out with Dad, when they work things out with our Heavenly Father, we should rejoice and be glad. But what the issue is, is the lack of love. One for another. Right? Now look, how dare we say, God, I love you, but we don't love each other. And then God's love is unconditional. We have a lot of, we have a lot of conditions on our love, don't we? The last thing is the forgotten cost. See, the argument goes, look, Dad, I've been home. I've been doing all these things, right? I've been being faithful for you. And that son of yours, he's off and having a grand time. And 
Let me ask you. Was that son off having a grand time? Was that younger son off having all the fun in the world? For a while, maybe. But where did he end up? Down in the pigs. He'd gone so low. And sometimes what we forget is that the consequences of people's sin kind of haunts them along the way. That here, the one brother was with the father. He enjoyed all that. He didn't have to experience the pain of rebellion. He didn't have to deal with the shame of sin. Like I said, my rebellion wasn't really long-lived. It was kind of packed in pretty intense pretty quick. And there are still things that I did during that period of time where I'm ashamed of that I did. And I'll have to carry those. There's things that I said to my, my folks that I will always have to relive in my mind. Right? Sin leaves scars along the way in our lives. Now I'm forgiven and all these things, but I still carry that. We're in Bible school and a bunch of us are sitting around. And I don't even really experience this. Get a bunch of Christians kind of getting around. And we all started talking about our rebellion. And some people were talking about some of the drugs that they did. Some people were talking about the drinking they did. And some of them the carousing and the parties. And, and we're all kind of sitting around and we're kind of talking about our before salvation days. And we're all kind of going around and we're kind of laughing and yucking it up. And we're doing all that. And we got home and my wife... Who's probably always been perfect. She's, uh, she's, <laughs> no, but she, but she, she didn't rebel. She was a faithful, uh, got saved as a teenager, and just loved the Lord. When we met, I was rebellious, and she loved the Lord, and God used her to bring me back to where I should be. But we got home, and and she looked at me, and she goes, "You know what?" Because I made a comment about, "Oh, you didn't talk much tonight," and she goes, "Well, I didn't." Experience that I didn't rebel. I didn't do all those things. And she goes, you know what? You guys made me fe- almost feel bad that I didn't rebel. Because we were glorifying it. We were going through. And I looked at her and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because we're, you know, there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of, a lot of things that go along in that package. We need to realize that those who wander are in the world. They get scarred by the world, they are hurt by the world we turn around, we look at the consequences that this younger son went off and even though know, he squandered it all guess what, he wasted his inheritance that's gone he turned around and now had to work for a Gentile which is a huge shame, in here he had to work with the pigs in here he had to so hungry, he wanted the food from the pigs, and the owner of the pigs says no, those are for the pigs, you don't even deserve that he was so desperate that he came dragging home. Dad, I'll be your servant. All of that was behind him. All those things he suffered. All the hurt. All the shame. None of that did the older son have to go through. He never had to pay that price. And over the years I've realized... When I get that older brother attitude, well, I can't believe them, and they just came back, and look at how the praise they get, and I'll get sort of this jealousy, and I'll get sort of this worked up, and say, oh, wait a minute, you know, I am being faithful, and I get nothing. And the father turns around and says, look, he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Right? You didn't have to go without. You didn't have to go be with the pigs. You didn't have to go. You enjoyed all of this. And those of you who are poorly younger, maybe you haven't rebelled, or maybe you walk with the Lord for a while. You've enjoyed the fellowship with God. You've enjoyed the blessings of Him. You've enjoyed all these things all the while you have it. Rejoice in that. And it was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and was found. Folks, when we see people come back to the Lord, it should be a thrill in our souls. That we shouldn't be the barrier for people to come back to God. 
And so many times I hear it over and over and over again. That I'm not against God, I'm just against the church. I've been hurt, I've been bruised. Not by God, but by believers. Because we act like the older brother. Folks, the conclusion of it all. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And we shouldn't be surprised. And we shouldn't be obstacles for those that are lost to come back. We should be the first one in the lines to give them a hug and say, we've missed you. We should be the first ones to welcome them back. And forgive and accept and love. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord. Lord, for those who have been here and sat here and been faithful for so many years, Lord, I, I know I, I can fall myself into that judgmental, selfish attitude that drives people away from you. Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me to be a bridge and not a wall to bring people to you. Lord, we thank you that you seek and save the lost. You seek broken people. You seek sinners. And Lord, help us rejoice when the lost are found. Help this church, Lord, to be a place of healing. Not a place of of wounds. Lord, check my attitude. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.